welcome Dimitr Kojabashev to our center. He's going to talk about Orenstein rings in stable form of material. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, everyone, for both having me and uh, being here. Uh, I'll try very hard not to bore you to death in the next one hour, but can't really promise much. So what I want to tell you about today is a certain generalization of a classical notion from commutative algebra in the dead of a Gordstein ring. A generalization that lives in the world of stable home topic theory. So I'll quickly remind you what classically uh, a Gordstein ring is, and then I'll spend a fair amount of time setting up uh, context or describing a kind of a, a category of the world where uh, one also has a notion of a commutative monoid, a ring-like object, uh, and where one could pose the question whether or not uh, one has an analog of this Gorenstein property from classical commutative algebra. If I manage to do this in a reasonable amount of time, I'll motivate this generalized Gorenstein uh, property by uh, showing you a bunch of examples they're in some sense exotic. Uh, uh, exotic in the sense that they come as the output of some overly complicated derived algebra geometry machinery and are kind of like uh, cool to look at and do exhibit this generalized uh, Kornstein property. But that's hopefully. Uh, before that, we go back to, I tend to say it's high school, but it's not high school, so go back to. Um, let's say classical uh, commutative algebra where we have the following definition so I'll start with the zero dimensional case as it's most easily trackable so if I start with uh, uh, a local uh, Neutherian ring R and I'll denote the maximal ideal with M and the corresponding residue field with K. So this is a local Neutherian zero dimensional zero dimensional ring. Then we say that R is Gorenstein. Uh, so in this case, there's a very kind of like, in some sense, simple criterion, or the definition is kind of easy. If we look at home in R modules from K into R, both being seen as R modules. So if this is zero dimensional, uh, uh, it's one dimensional as a K vector space, or over K. So, I mean, that's just the definition, kind of the punchline or the uh, salt of this Gorenstein property is that it should be seen as some kind of duality. So, uh, if we define for an R module M, the dual of M to be just Hans over R from M into R, just a fractal definition. Uh, then it's kind of a claim or a fact. If R is a Gorenstein ring, this dualizing object or this du dual of M behaves uh, as one would expect from a dual to behave. Then uh, say D behaves well. For example, uh, if you take the double dual uh, of m and then it's finite enough, then you would get m. But in general, this is so if r is not Gorenstein, of course, uh, very rarely this kind of naive dual would do the job. And in general, what you have is so for a general r, 
uh, one needs to define the dual of n as being Holmes over R from n into something that could be and sometimes is denoted by omega and is known in this case as the dualizing module. And I guess the, the, the punchline of a why one reason why Bornstein rings could be interesting is that if R is Bornstein, then it is its own dualizing module. So if R is Bornstein, then this dualizing module is just the original ring. Uh, Should there be a transition uh, yeah. I mean, I'm kind of like boxing in a lot of finiteness conditions, just a bird's eye view of, I guess, what one wants. I mean, I also already mentioned here that there's some finiteness conditions involved if one wants to be precise. Let's look at uh, a few examples of zero dimensional Bornstein rings. So I can take R to be, so I'm going to draw some pictures that I probably won't be able to explain very nice, but okay, let's look at R being K for we'll call our series in with one variable, x, and I'm going out by x to the power of 5. Um, so a picture that sometimes help and it's kind of geometrically motivating for the duality property that Gornstein rings have is uh, whenever you stare at a ring and maybe wonder if it is Gornstein or not, a picture that helps is to draw something that kind of looks like the monomial basis of, 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 of your R. So here in this case, I'm going to have a bunch of blocks. So a block generated by 1, by x, by x squared, x cubed, and x to the fourth. And I mean, if you just try to calculate this, uh, it will turn out that, so this form, it will turn out that this is one dimensional, which I mean, one way to see this is that I guess an equivalent definition of being Bornstein is that, as I've never been able to pronounce, is that the circle of the module is one dimensional, and this is kind of clear with this ring. But kind of, we're going to look at a few more examples, but kind of the, the, the manifestation of the Bornstein property for this R is that this bottom block that generates this as a K module is just one block, if you wish. Now, so this ring is Bornstein. To show you something that's not Bornstein, I can again take a formal power series ring, this time in two variables, and uh, I kill x squared, x y, and maybe y squared. If I draw the same monomial basis picture, then I have 1 at the top, I have x and y at the bottom, and that's it. Kind of these two blocks at the bottom correspond to the fact that this home or the circle is two dimensional. So this in this case is dimension two, therefore R is not Bornstein. I can make this ring Bornstein if I kill a bit less. So if I instead look at R normal power series in x and y, and this time I just kill x squared and y squared. And I again draw my block picture. Now I have the one, x and y, and then I have x, y at the bottom. And then the dimension of the corresponding column will be one generated exactly by x, y. So as I said, that's kind of the geometric, in terms of picture, uh, manifestation of this well as property. The way you should think of a Bornstein ring is that if you draw this picture and you turn it upside down, if it's symmetric and it looks as the original picture, then your ring is Bornstein. So if you take this, flip it around, it looks the same, whereas this does not. So it's a way to think about this, uh, this property. In some sense, the, the Bornstein property is a bit more at least for me, unintuitive than, let's say, uh, regularity or Cohen Macaulay or, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you, you take a ring and you stare at it and it's kind of hard to say whether it's Kornstein or not. Also, there is not that, again, at least for me, uh, geometric intuition behind it, but that's one way. 
and you could see it. So in higher dimension, of course, this definition does not work. Uh, and uh, if you cross the leak, we have the following in general for higher dimensional rings. So if again, uh, RMK is a, let's say, d-dimensional uh, local Ethereum, let's say, d-dimensional ring, then R is Bornstein, and there again, I write two different uh, equivalent characterizations. So one way is to look at so-called X groups, of yep, K R. So these are the right functors of the home functor. And if it happens that they are concentrated in a single degree, where they're K, and that degree is exactly the dimension of your ring, and they're zero everywhere else, and the ring is Gordonstein. So if you have a zero dimensional ring, X0 is just homes, and this uh, sense to the original definition. The duality aspect of the uh, the Gorenstein property is more clearly visible if you take an equivalent characterization, or so equivalently, we can look at the local cohomology groups of uh, R with coefficients in itself. And if it happens again that these are concentrated in a single degree, equal to the crew dimension, where they are given by the injective hull of the residue field. Got the essential, maximal essential extension of K, I is D, and zero else, then, then R is born. So, of course, these things are much harder to check in general. Uh, there is a way to descend to the zero dimensional case if you have an arbitrary ring, uh, if you can pick a non zero divisor in your ring. You can check if your Original ring module this non zero divisor is Gorenstein, and similarly to like, Cohen, Macaulay, etc. Then, if the quotient is Gorenstein, the original ring is going to be Gorenstein. So, mo most of the time, sometimes there is a way to descend to kind of like a zero dimensional case and check things there. So, for the sake of time, I'm going to start running and not spend more time giving you examples from classical. We have the and switch gears and uh, dive into the world of stable homotopy theory. So what I want to do now is take either of the three definitions that you saw and put them or find or introduce a generalization of them in, a, in another category. So this all happens in the category of rings or commutative rings. I'm going to introduce a different category, so-called stable homotopy category. I'm going to talk about commutative monoids there and uh, pin down what it means for a commutative monoid in this more general sense to be Bornstein. It's going to take some time, so bear with me. Uh, so now we jump to stable homotopy theory. Now, I'm going to as I said, introduce a category, and I'm going to start by pinning down what the objects are. So, slight change from the previous 20 minute talk that I tried to give here. So, instead of a sequential, I'll talk about a symmetric spectrum now. So, a symmetric spectrum, let's call it X, is the following data, or consists of. So for each natural number, I'm given a point in topological space, we'll let x n. So this is something in the point in topological category, together with an action of the symmetric group sigma n, the sigma n action. This action has to be uh, continuous and base point preserving. And again, for each natural number, the rest of the data is that I have a so-called structure map, which goes from this nth level of my spectrum, xn, smashed with the one sphere into xn plus 1. So this product here of pointed topological spaces, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of, as a picture, if I have my x, I smash it with s, I get a cone, and then I collapse. So 
where I get a cylinder and then I collapse all of this. So I kind of suspend X between these two points. This is also called the reduced suspension of X. Uh, so I have a map like this. It's continuous and this data is subject to the following condition. So I have a bunch of spaces, a bunch of maps, some equivariants. Uh, this data is such that if I look at the following composition, so I start from xn smash sn, and what can I do now? I can start, so sn, the n folds here is just s1 n times, so I can start peeling off copies of s1 one by one, so I can look at the sigma n structure map times the identity, and I'll end up in xn smash sn minus one. I can continue doing this for a while until I end up into xn plus n with the structure map sigma n plus n. And I want this composition to be sigma n smash times sigma n equivariant. So the action on the source is clear. I have the sigma n action on xn sigma n m acts on the sphere just by permutative coordinates. I have a sigma n plus m action here, and I just take the restriction of that action to sigma n times sigma n. So that's just a thing. We call it a symmetric spectrum. The nth topological space is called the nth level of the spectrum. It's just an object. It's not a category yet, what I've been describing. So let's talk about morphisms. They're the obvious thing, so a morphism or a map of symmetric spectra. Well, it's, it's kind of the, the only thing it could be. So uh, there's an F from X to Y. Uh, or maybe that's right about this. So it's it is a collection uh, fn from xn to yn. So a bunch of maps for every natural number, and they have the compatible the structure that I've so far described. So it's just an obvious commutative diagram that has to an obvious diagram that has to be commutative. So if I look at the sigma n structure map of my spectrum x, and if I look at the sigma and structure map of y, and this is my map or morphism f, well then this diagram has to commute and everything inside has to be equivariant enough. So these are equivariant sigma and equivariant maps. <coughs> As I said, nothing surprising, just the obvious thing. And so we write, so now this becomes a category, so we write SP. Sometimes people write uh, the superscript sigma to distinguish this from many other uh, variants, well, not many, but enough other models for the, for the category spectrum. Symmetric spectrum. Okay, so it's a category, not that much structure in it. Uh, the primary invariant that's of interest to a number of anthropologists working in stable homotopy theory of a gadget like this are the homotopy groups in the spectrum. So if I have an X uh, inside SP and I have K, an arbitrary integer, then the K homotopy group. X is defined as the following co-limit. So I have colon over some diagram or uh, n, and here I have by k by n plus k of x n, where this is the ordinary homotopy group of topological space. So this co-limit is taken over a diagram. So I have to show you a map from pi k n plus. Uh, I have to show you a map from here to pi n plus k plus one. 
of x n plus 1. And how do things which are map? Well, I can first smash with the one sphere. And I end up in pi n plus k plus 1 of x n. And then I can take the structure map or the mapping used to bone the use of the structure map and, and where I want to, to end. And the coordinate is taking over this, like, this system. So as you know, the homotopy groups of a space for large ends have the structure of an abelian group. So this co-limit inherits the structure of an abelian group. Uh, and if we look at the collection, which is often denoted as pi star of x, which is just all of these, pi k of x, this is a graded abelian group. Yeah. Now one crucial difference between what you know as homotopy groups of a space and these is that now you have a z worth of data instead of just uh, n where n is the natural numbers worth of data. So here, subscript could be any integer. So your y star of x could have stuff in negative degrees, stuff in positive degrees, etc. So it's kind of like there's just more stuff than what you would expect class. And just as a remark, a spectrum which has no negative homotopy groups is called connective spectrum. And there's a procedure by which if I'm given any spectrum, I can kill or cut off these negative homotopy groups and obtain something connected. All right. So some examples of these things. Um, of course, so the simplest. So I'm going to skip giving you information about the sigma in action, because it's not crucial. I'll say why we need this action at the end. But first example is the so-called sphere spectrum. So usually denoted by this dollar sign, one of the ways. Uh, at level n, it's just the ends here. And the structure maps are the obvious homeomorphisms from Sn smash S1 to Sn plus 1. Very important gadget in stable homotopy theory, as I mentioned the previous time. Very briefly, if you look at the homotopy groups of this thing, these things are known as the stable homotopy groups of spheres. I have a mysterious object, and a large amount of effort has been invested in computing them in various ranges, but they do remain largely unknown. Uh, so we have the sphere spectrum, any space, topological space, also gives rise to a spectrum. So if I take k a point in topological space, I have the so-called, let's write it like this, so these are known as suspension spectrum. So I take a k, point in topological space, and I produce something that's usually denoted by sigma infinity k, and that's an object in spectra. At level n, uh, this thing is just given by my topological space k times Sn. And the structure map again here is obvious. I do the only thing I can and it is reasonable to do. In some sense, the usual homotopy theory of spaces and beds or is part of this stable homotopy category. Uh, so if you look at the spectrum associated, the suspension spectrum associated to a space, it's a connective spectrum, so it has no negative homotopy groups, and it kind of recover classical or unstable homotopy theories as part of this stable picture. Uh, Another example that you've definitely seen manifested in some sense are the so-called island or complaint spectra. <clears throat> so here I start with uh, an abelian group, A, and out of it I get what's known as HA for the island or complaint spectrum associated with A. So this is a gadget in here. At level N, uh, 
this is given by what's usually denoted as k a comma n or the eigenvalence space of type a n. So this is a topological space which is characterized uniquely by the property that if I look at its homotopy, it's zero everywhere but at this degree n uh, where it's a. So all the homotopy is concentrated in a single degree where it's given by this, this abelian group. These are kind of like basic building blocks that you can use to create things that have specific homotopy and specific degree. The structure maps are a bit, I mean, I didn't mention them, I think, the previous time, but uh, let's skip them for now. Uh, so, a sigma n, is it any, any group or is it a symmetric group? Sigma n is a symmetric group. It is a symmetric group on any elements. So, okay, those are a few basic examples of spectra. Now, the category spectra has a lot more structure than just a category. And this is uh, <coughs> the topic of our next little discussion. So, it is actually a symmetric monoid, a post symmetric monoid category. So, it has an internal monoid smash product, as we call it. So, I'll state this as a as a, or as a claim, as a to prove it. But, so SP uh, can be equipped with a symmetric monoidal structure, closed symmetric monoidal structure. So we have an internal one as well. Closed symmetric monoidal structure. Uh, what that means is that I can define some notion of a product there, and that product is associated with symmetric in the appropriate sense. So, and I have a unit with respect to that um, uh, that product, or maybe I should say, with unit the sphere spectrum. So I'll write. Uh, SP, and then I'll write this wedge symbol for this match product. Alternative notion, uh, notations are the tensor product. You can put whatever you want there, as long as you know what, you, what it means. And S is a unit. Uh, so, once we have it, so I mean, the, it took quite a while for people to pin down uh, kind of a a concrete definition of this match product was very elusive for a fair amount of time. And this category of symmetric spectrum is one of the possible ways to write down explicitly what this is. Because in some sense, I mean, what, what's a spectrum? A spectrum is like, if I have two spectra, I have these collection of spaces, and if I need to define the product of the two, I have to in some sense kind of say how to combine them. Like, I, I can't just take the product, like if I have an X and Y, uh, what, what would I do by x, y, at level n? So, the sigma action allows to define coherently this, this gadget here, so that we again get a spectrum. And furthermore, uh, the resulting product is symmetric monoidal, uh, is a symmetric monoidal product. So it took a while for people to define this, and symmetric spectrum is just one of the possible ways to, to define it. Uh, but, we care that it's there and it exists, and it allows us to talk about commutative monoids in this category, just in general monoids. So that's, I guess, the next pseudo definition. So if I have a possibly commutative monoid in commutative monoid, let's call it R in SP, it's called a symmetric or potentially a commutative, I'll drop the word symmetric, a commutative ring spectrum. So what's, I mean, again, you can unpack what this means in terms of structure maps, etc., but <coughs> uh, 
What this means is that I'm basically given a map from the sphere spec root named R, which is a unit in the monoidal structure, and it serves as the unit, and I have some kind of multiplication map from R smash R into R, and these are compatible in the appropriate sense, associativity, unitality, etc. So that's what a monoid is, or a commutative monoid. We call these things ring spectra. Side effect of, of course, having this extra structure on a spectrum is that this adds more structure to the homotopy groups. So, kind of like a, a remark. Uh, if R, and I'll write C algebras in spectra for commutative monoids in spectra. So if R is such a thing, then the homotopy groups, but like the full homotopy groups of R, is a graded commutative ring. There's a sign appearing if we, if we interchange factors. So examples of these things, of course, the sphere spectrum itself is a, an example of a, of a ring spectrum, a unit ring spectrum. Um, so one sphere spectrum itself. You can also take now any ring or commutative ring, let's say, R, and look at the corresponding other eigenvectorplane spectrum. It will be a ring spectrum. Some other things that you may or may not have seen, uh, this generalized cohomology or cohomology theory known as uh, complex gate theory. Uh, it ends up being a spectrum as well, usually denoted as KU, so that's complex K theory. So that's a commutative ring spectrum. Uh, here you can take KU, KO. Uh, what kind of degrading do you on these? On the rings? Yes. So KU, I think. It's not uh, anymore. Hmm? It's not degrading. No, this is degraded. I mean, you're looking at complex vector bundles over uh, compact Hausdorff space. No periodic. Uh, this is periodic, yeah, but it's. So this is two periodic in the sense that the homotopy groups are two periodic. KO is a period, like the usual block period is, is reflected in the uh, rings of uh, homotopy groups. But they are still Z graded. I mean you still have Z word of data, it's just periodic. <coughs> so there are, I mean, these just few examples are to uh, kind of tell you that these things do exist. And the last thing I want to say about this stable homotopy category before I jump to the Kornstein condition in, in this case uh, is the following. So there's, I can put even more structure on the category spectrum. So that's another claim. So SP can be equipped with the so-called model structure, with a model structure, I'll say it in a bit what that is, uh, making it a model category, symmetric monoidal closed model category. So what's a model structure? You start with a category and you specify three distinguished sets of morphisms. So these are usually called weak equivalences that I'll abbreviate just by W, vibrations, and co -fibrations. So these are three sets of morphisms in C, uh, or in spectra in English here. Uh, these three classes need to have some compatibility between each other, so plus some axioms. So you specify these three distinguished sets, and there are some axioms that have to be satisfied. This structure, once you have it on a category, allows you in a very concrete and set, theoretic, uh, set theoretically manageable way to define what's known as the homotopy category of your category. And here, if this is the first time you 
hear about this concept, you should think about chain complexes and or you should think like of a category of uh, um, modules and the associated category of chain complexes. So uh, so this so this or let's say the construction it is if C is a model category so I've specified these three classes of morphisms in C then out of C by some well-defined localization procedure I can obtain a new category that's formally obtained by making all the morphisms in this category data in this set W of weak equivalences in vertical isomes. And in homotopy theory, this is denoted as the homotopy category of C. So there is some procedure of inverting or localizing these morphisms. And it's universal in the sense that if I have any other category and any other pointer which sends each morphism in uh, W to an ISO, it factors through this localization factor uniquely. And as I started to say, uh, the example we should think of, if I guess you are coming from algebraic geometry or commutative algebras, you can take a commutative ring. You can look at the category of R modules. You can look at the class of, uh, you can look at uh, uh, chain complexes of R modules. So you can, your C would be the category of chain complexes of R modules, dominant and dominant, I don't care at this point. And uh, W can be the class of quasi isos And what you get by this formally formal inversion is known as the derived category of your green R. So this procedure and this example of the stable homotopy category is just a kind of fast generalization of, of, of this process. But you should keep in mind this example of spectra and everything else is amount. And I'm going to... Would you please uh, say again the four types of morphisms that you consider weak equivalences? Then vibrations and co-vibrations. So in this case, I mean, one possible model structure that you can put on chain complexes is you can take what I asked you says weak equivalences. As vibrations, you can take uh, uh, epimorphisms, so maps, level, maps which are level-wise epis. In positive degrees, and I think as more as small vibrations, you can take more morphisms with projected curve kernel. And these three classes do satisfy the axioms and allow you to obtain the derived category of the ring uh, R. But it, they're not the only trees, they're different model structures, equivalent in some appropriate sense, etc. So <clears throat> I guess what you should remember from this whole discussion is the following. I'll call it a dictionary. Uh, so if if we're in the world of classical commutative algebra, we have Z as kind of the kind of the initial ring. We can talk about Z modules. We can talk about Z algebras. And the notion of equivalence here is the hard or concrete isomorphism. We can also talk about DG algebras. We wish. Um, then oh, I, we can talk then about DG modules, DG algebras, and here the appropriate notion is some kind of quasi iso, and we have this object known as the derived category. So this is kind of the classical side. On the spectral level side, we now have the sphere spectrum as the initial ring. And we can talk about S modules, and the abelian groups in this spectrum level side. S algebras are the rings, uh, weak equivalences, whatever that is, I haven't defined them in the case of spectrum, I'm not going to, uh, are the appropriate notion of an equivalence, and we end up here with the homotopy category of spectrum. And we also can look at, let's say, AZ, this algebraic plane spectrum. HC modules, HC algebras, uh, again, weak equivalences, and the homotopy category of HC modules. So this table is both a dictionary and kind of a theorem because it's a claim 
due to many people that these two columns are actually equivalent or isomorphic in some appropriate sense. So whether you talk about DG objects in classical commutative algebra or you talk about HZ modules or algebras in spectra, these two things are the same. So kind of like a fair amount of classical commutative algebra can be embedded or seen as part of this stable homotopy category. All right. Now we're drastic change of gears. Uh, so what's what could be the definition of a Bornstein commutative ring spectrum in this case? Well, I mean it's just rewriting the original definition in the exact same symbols, but now taking to uh, seem to take place in the in the stable homotopy category. So a map. So here, because we have no notion of a residue field at this point, we have no, no, I mean, and ideals are kind of tricky to also talk about. Spectral, suppose that we're given a map, uh, R to K of ring spectral, which should emulate a ring map from a ring to its residue field. So a map R to K in commutative algebra in spectra is Bornstein of some shift integer shift A if if I look at homes in now R modules but in spectra from K to R this is equivalent and here I write sigma A of R which is just I take the so I didn't define this notion but this is just the A fold sphere but seen as a spectrum so if you wish this is the suspension spectrum associated to the A sphere times R. So this is this construction. Do, do you have any condition on K? There are a lot of conditions on K, finiteness conditions, but I'm going to black box them for the sake of uh, saying something that could be seen as modeling what happens. But yes, you're right. There's, there are smallest conditions on K that would one needs to uh, have in order to make sense of or for this definition to make sense. But what I want to, I guess, emphasize is that I've just set up in a hand wavy matter a different context where this definition of being Bornstein makes sense. It means something, whatever it means, and maybe there's a connection with the original notion of being Bornstein. So it's a claim that if I have a commutative ring spectrum R and its coefficients are Bornstein, so if R in commutative algebra spectra, uh, or let's just talk about the map. If R and K, is, yeah, okay, let's, if this uh, is such that high star of R as an ordinary ring is for sign. Then R into the, and now I take HK, where here I take the other end spectrum associated with some field K, and K here is just pi naught of R. Uh, so K is pi naught of R. So this is Gorenstein. So if your coefficients are Gorenstein, then your ring spectrum is Gorenstein. Uh, the reverse is not necessarily true. Actually, it's almost never true. Um, so, for example, uh, KO, the connective real K theory has overly complicated, I can never remember, coefficient ring. So, I'm, this is Z, and then I have eta on. So generator eta one alpha four with weird names indicating degrees. So I have this, and then I portion by eta cubed, eta alpha, alpha squared, or eta, and then two eta. So it's an overly complicated ring. One can check that this is not Gorenstein, but the corresponding ring spectrum. So this is not Gorenstein. Or but the corresponding ring spectrum is a shift uh, minus 5, I think. 
So in some sense, we have not just taken the classical notion and not gotten any new examples. So, but KO is Gordon's time of shift minus five. All right, so in the last six to seven minutes, I'm gonna introduce a whole new bag of examples of Bornstein spectra that come from this machinery, uh, derived out of geometry machinery, known as uh, topological modular forms. So uh, I will jump to Well, it's still stable on the theorem, I'm going to write that uh, So, let M1N to be moduli stack of elliptic curves uh, with a fixed point, or with a, yeah, with a fixed point of exactly order N. So some geometric gadget encoding this moduli problem of the curves with the fixed point order n. Uh, there is a process to add a bit more curves in this stack, known as the Lindbom for compactification. What this does is it adds elliptic curves which are singular, but we don't allow all types of singularities, we allow only normal singularities away from the origin. So this is the, the Lindbom for compactification. of n1 n. So for specific values of n, you've probably seen this if you haven't seen it in general. So for n equal to 1, these stacks are known as uh, ML, or the moduli stack of elliptic curves, and this is compactification. So. Uh, so it's a huge, there's a huge theorem in Stable home topic theory. Too many people. Gors, Hopkins, Miller. In the language of infinity categories, to Murray. And for these particular stacks, to Hill and Lawson. Which says that these stacks admit a sheaf on them. So, is this the sheaf? I'll call it home top uh, on M1N, which takes values in commutative ring spectra. So this is on the affine and tile side on M1N, and this sheaf extends to the compactified stack. So I mean, the theorem itself says that, okay, there is another sheet that one can construct. It doesn't, uh, that's kind of meaningful in stable home topic theory, but it doesn't end in, or it doesn't take values in commutative ring spectra. And it can actually be lifted to a sheet like this, which is kind of like a big theorem. But for us, this is just some overly complicated black box that, uh, as input, takes something very geometrical, or derived outright geometrical, and spits out things in stable homotopy theory. So, uh, a definition. So, the commutative ring spectra of topological modular forms with level structure. These are given or defined as, as I said, I take these two stacks. I don't want to lift them because I have seen this quotient. I feed them into this black box known as on top. I take global sections and I get one of three things. So I can either get something known as all capital TMF1N, which is a periodic commutative ring spectrum obtained as the global sections on the uncompactified stack. Uh, 
I can get what's known as capital T lowercase mf1n, which I obtain by evaluating the sheaf on the compactified guy. Or I can take the connective cover of this last thing, or I can cut off all negative homotopy groups and obtain what's known as whole lowercase tmf1f. So the connective cover, or the procedure by which I obtain a connective spectrum from a non-connected form, sometimes denoted by tau greater than or equal to 1. So these are, this is an infinite family of commutative ring spectra for which I can ask the question, are any of them Gorenstein? Before I do that, uh, the reason for the name, topological modular forms, the reason from the main comes from the fact that their coefficient rings are well known, at least rationally, in number theory. So the uh, claim is that if I look at the coefficient ring of TMF1n, uh, at least rationally, or if I kill all the torsion, this is the same as the classical ring of weakly homomorphic integral modular forms. So maybe this is denoted as MF SL2Z. Integral. So let's see. So modular torsion, the coefficients of these TNF guys are these well known and studied rates. Um, oops, not SL2Z, sorry. Uh, I have to take a congruent subgroup, so gamma 1 n. And for n equal to 1, I get uh, SL2Z here. Uh, okay, so for reasons that I can at this stage only explain with this picture at the beginning with the blocks and flipping back and forth, it makes sense to ask only the Gorenstein question for the connected guys. So the non-connected guys have like homotopy in positive and negative degrees, and if you think of the Gorenstein property just as this, if you mirror things, they look the same very Rarely, a non-connective thing will be Gorenstein. I mean, it could happen, but very rarely. So kind of the question a priori is most interesting for the connected guys. So this is the question that we ask. Are any of this infinite family TMF1Ns Gorenstein? And the surprising answer is that there's a finite list uh, that has kind of interesting connections with uh, the cerebrality that happens on the corresponding moduli stacks and some number theoretic arithmetic, but uh, yeah, the list is very finite. So it's a theorem. Oops. Uh, that the connective TMF1N. So, theorem. So, for the case of n equals to 1, this is due to Stunyanovska, less than Stunyanovska. Uh, the rest of the cases we showed with either an algebraic geometrical approach due to Leonard Meyer or kind of a more number theoretically commutative algebra approach due to me. So uh, answer yes for n equal to 1, uh, 2, 3 and so forth, 8, 11, 14, 15 or potentially 23. <clears throat> now, the crucial bit here is that, or, or I guess the interesting bit here is that all these rings, the rings of modular forms have been well studied classically. They're largely unknown and fairly complicated. So, if one would want to approach this problem by just looking at the coefficients, this is above level 5, I think, almost an impossible task because these rings are insane. So these 
So this theorem kind of says that we have a potentially the coefficients could be Gorenstein as well. I don't know. But the theorem says that we have a bunch of examples of purely Gorenstein or potentially purely Gorenstein ring spectra uh, that we cannot in any way check whether or not are Gorenstein uh, in the classical sense looking at their coefficients. And this, this list is kind of cool to obtain from two directions and I'll just say this and maybe I'll shut up then seeing that I do have like three or four more minutes. Let me see if I'm not missing anything overly important. Um, so the way one could approach this, there are two ways for kind of illustrate the richness maybe of uh, what I'm discussing so far. So two, two strategies. At proving, proving the theorem. So one is you can start with. So this is I'll write it as a recipe. You can start with a ring spectrum R, uh, and suppose that R is Gorenstein. Now that means that if I look at the rationalization of R, so that's a new spectrum that I'll write as R subscript zero. Same way as in constructed, like the intuition behind this construction is the same as in the matrix right? I construct a new ring spectrum whose homotopy groups are the homotopy groups of the original one, but modulo of torsion, like a rationalization of this thing. So if my original spectrum is, uh, ring spectrum is Gorenstein, then so it's rationalization. And under certain condition, then this implies that under some conditions, this then implies that the homotopy groups of the rationalization as an ordinary ring is Gorenstein. And under some more conditions, finiteness conditions, this implies that the Hilbert series of this ring, so pi star r naught, so this formal sum of the dimension of each piece of the ring, uh, by k of r not tk. So this Hubert series. Dimension of the dimensions? Okay. Dimension what? The dimension is taken over what? Well, for the field of national numbers? No, yeah, yeah. I mean it's the these are q vector spaces. Uh, so if so if, if if the coefficients are rushed, uh, the coefficients are Gorenstein, then these Hubert series satisfy a functional equation. And now, one way we can approach part of this theorem is we start from the, we start backwards. We, so there are classical riemann rock formulas which can pull out the dimension of the weight k or the k piece of this ring of modular forms. We calculate all the Hilbert series of the various TMF1 ends and check which ones, which of those satisfy the function of equations. Those are potential Gorenstein candidates. In order to show that they're actually more on side, you can do a bit, you have to do a bit more work after that. But this is kind of like a quick filter procedure, pulling info from number theory, which basically immediately narrows down the list of these cases. So very elementary approach, but immediately one obtains this list. Uh, as I said, a bit more work is needed to be done in order to show they're actually born stuff. What Leonard Meyer did, he came from a completely different direction. So this is Meyer, and then I stop. Uh, so he studied, uh, look at, so he studied the moduli set. So look at these M1 n and M1 n bars. It turns out that they are quite tractable. Uh, they have cohomological dimension one, and they do have certain duality on them. So. Uh, and study certain quality. So it turns out that if you look at what the dualizing sheaves on these stacks look like, or kind of like how they decompose, you see that there's some symmetry in the kind of like the decomposition, and again, these exact list of numbers shows up. So. Uh, only for 
And from 1 to 8, 11, 14, again 15, and 23, does the dualizing sheaf, let's say on M1 and bar, looks like as the tensor power of some omega, let's say, looks like there's some tricky number here. I'm going to, how should I note it? Some function of n, I guess, maybe. Only in these cases, the dualizing sheet is of a very concrete form. There's some symmetry involved, but again, the, the exact same numbers show up. And it turns out that if you have certain duality on the stack, uh, that leads to Gorenstein duality for the associated uh, ring spectrum of the global sections uh, when we look at this sheet on top. So it turns out that there is a very intricate relation between, let's say, stable homotopy theory and this Gorenstein duality, or Gorenstein property, and derived outright geometry, if you wish, and serial duality. So in some sense, one leads to the other, or you can detect the presence of one in this specific case, the presence of the other. I'll shut up by saying that this is only the beginning of the story. What I'm actually interested in is the point in time where you stick a finite group G everywhere in sight. So we take a group G that acts on all the objects that I've talked about. Uh, these stacks M1, N bar, and M1, N have a natural action of G equal to the units in Z mod N. And you start to look at all these questions equivariant. So what does it mean to be Gorenstein in an equivariant sense? Do we have now only integer shifts in the definitions, or can we allow shifts in, let's say, the representation ring of the group? Uh, what does it even mean to have equivariant zero duality there, if it means anything at all, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But kind of like this is the beginning of the story, the non-equivariant picture, which was more or less less known uh, up to this point, and the real fun stuff become, comes when you pick a group and you don't pick a large group. <laughs> C2, let's say. I'll shut up. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, I would ask two things about you. Okay. The first one is Gerstein. In algebra geometry, Gerstein rings uh, give rise of uh, some kind of mild singularities. So my question is, why here the ring is chosen to be the time? Second, is this related somehow with the properties of the singularities in algebra geometry? Or more generally, more maybe, if the spectrum in the sense that you defined and the spectrum in the sense of Lutendic have something common more than the syntax? Something common, common in semantics, so, rather than only syntax. So the, I'll answer the second question first because the answer is, is easiest. Uh, in terms of relation between the two words of spectrum, no, there is none. I mean, it's a completely different notion of a spectrum, just a coincidence of the of the, the the name. As far as whether or not, in the case where you have a stack and you have a sheet full of commutative ring spectra on it. If you take the global sections and you obtain a Gorenstein ring in this sense, whether or not this tells you something about this singularities or whatever, whether it tells you something about the geometry, I don't know. I hope, maybe, but I haven't even started thinking about this. So, maybe it does encode some kind of information about the, the, the geometry. So far, I've tracked down only, in a very specific case, the fact that there is a relation with serial duality, okay. but nothing more. As for your first question, uh, I spoke only about the notion of a Gorenstein ring spectrum, but you're completely right. Uh, the more interesting notion to speak is this duality property that involves mapless lifts, etc. And this is another part of this story that can be extended to ring spectra. So there is a notion of Gorenstein duality in ring spectra that I didn't discuss because for the sake of time. And the interesting thing is that if in classical commutative algebra you have a Gorenstein ring, and this automatically leads to kind of like mathless duality or whatever, in ring spectra it does not. So the fact that you are Gorenstein as a ring spectrum does not imply Gorenstein duality. 
There's an extra condition that you have to check. And actually, it's the more interesting question. It turns out that these rings are not just Gorenstein, but they do have Gorenstein duality in the appropriate ring spectrum sense. But just for the sake of time, I decided to cut off this other part because, I mean, it's a mouthful. But it's, it's a very interesting question, and it's actually the more interesting thing. So checking that they're Gorenstein is easy, but checking that they have Gorenstein duality in the screen spectral sense is, is difficult. And one more thing in the spectrum, I'm sorry. Uh, stable. Why is uh, this uh, not stable in the quantum theory? I mean, uh, one possible definition is that, uh, or explanation is the, Kind of the, the if you wish, look at the, the way I define the homotopy groups of a spectrum. It's kind of a co-limit that stabilizes in some sense, so it picks up like only the, the, the persistent information in the long run in this directed uh, system remains. But this kind of follows? It does, yeah, for spaces at least. Yeah. For which spaces? For spaces. For spaces. The homotopy groups stabilize due to something known as Frodenthal suspension theory. So there's a theorem that says that if you start suspending a space, you basically increase the connectivity and at some point it stabilizes. But for which spaces? For all spaces. For all spaces. Any topological spaces? Yeah. But these are, so, I mean, don't mistake stable homotopy groups of a space. So if I, if I pick a space, I can produce out of it a spectrum. This was this sigma infinity of x. And the homotopy groups of this thing were this co -limit. So these are known as the stable homotopy groups of the space. These are not, I mean, part of them are the usual homotopy groups, but I'm not claiming that the usual homotopy groups of the space just magically stabilize. I'm not saying that in this co -limit, it does, due to, as I said, this fruit and tau suspension theorem. Okay. <laughs> Is there no other questions? Well, let's leave the other questions for... Yeah.